My name is Michael Vogel. Um, I was asked to give Dr. Hornberger's presentation, and I tried to use his slides. Um, ended up, I changed most of them. Uh, the set that ended up in your notebook is not exactly the set the way that I wanted you to see it. And then having listening for the last couple of days, I actually added three or four view graphs as well. So you can try to follow me in the book, but uh, I was assured that these slides will be available on the web so people can download them at a later point in time. Correct? And, and if people give us the right address on the form that we sent around, they will actually get a, a CD with, with the uh, final slide set. All right, I had <clears throat> no intention of making this a talk about Yucca Mountain, but I do want to stay within the U.S. regulations. Uh, they're a little bit more challenging than some of the international regulations, and I'd like to, when we talk about repositories in the U.S., I'm going to have to talk a little bit about regulations that really apply to Yucca Mountain. Um, there's an issue with the term high-level waste through the regulations. Some sometimes it includes spent nuclear fuel, sometimes it doesn't. If I say high-level waste, I do mean high-level waste glass. And I'll apologize, I will say spent nuclear fuel because the regulations I'm going to be talking about do say spent nuclear fuel. I do appreciate why we should call it used fuel. Um, I have actually an author of a paper or two that says used fuel, but I will refer to it as spent nuclear fuel. To tie this talk to a couple of things that were said over the past couple of days, I want to remind you that the reactor technologies that we're talking about, the repository being the back end of that cycle, were originally developed to get plutonium needed for a bomb in World War II. Um, I want to point out that reprocessing technologies have never been driven by economics in this country. And finally, that um, byproduct heat from reactor technology was, in fact, attractive for power generation. And Pushing the advance button doesn't work. Oh, there we go. Um, the need for the repositories, um, repository development came about following uh, the reactor development, and reactor development came about uh, following Eisenhower's speech on atoms for peace. And in particular, by the mid-1950s, the U.S. had uh, made a decision to take reactor technology that was developed as part of the Naval Propulsion Programs, make that commercial, and use uh, civilian-owned and operated reactors. The first power plant operational in this country was at Shipping Port in Pennsylvania, and that went online in 1955. And this is a, a very important point about how I want to tie what I'm talking about to what you've heard over the last two days. At the time that decision was made, to, to go commercial, we were reprocessing in this country. The um, National Academy of Sciences was asked in 1955, the same year shipping port went online, what will we do with the wastes from the reprocessing of the civilian spent nuclear fuel? Those reprocessing wastes were liquids, and they were both radioactive and chemically hazardous. In 1957, the National Academy sent out a report that said, disposal in cavities mined in salt is suggested as a possibility promising the most practical, immediate solution of the problem. So yes, we did get started on a repository program in 1957. It was started in salt, but I would like you to remember it was reprocessing wastes that we began our repository program with. I'll try to remember to point out when that changed and how it changed, but uh, it's kind of most people have forgotten this. We got to salt because we were disposing reprocessing wastes. This is a picture of uh, an experiment from Project Salt Vault in the salt mine at Lyons, Kansas in the late 1960s, just to show that we were doing some research. That National Academy report also pointed out that the Academy was convinced that radioactive waste can be disposed of safely in a variety of ways and at a large number of sites in the United States. They pointed out it may require several years of research and pilot testing before the first such disposal system can be put into operation. That was 1957, and we haven't made a lot of progress, have we? Um, uh, Lyons, Kansas failed in the, in the early 70s. There were technical and uh, sociopolitical reasons for that. The Energy Research and Development uh, Administration created something called the National Waste Terminal Storage Program in the mid-70s, and it was a very ambitious plan. They were looking at siting and developing as many as six repositories. The first two were, in, were to be in salt. They were going to begin pilot-scale pilot operations by 1985. They were going to look at other rock types, particularly shale and granite. There were site investigations proposed in 36 states, and that began to cause a lot of turmoil. I'd like to point out at this time that uh, a couple of the sites that began to be looked at early in the National Waste Terminal Storage Program uh, were sites that were chosen because they were previously contaminated by, contaminated by weapons-related uh, activities. The Yucca Mountain site and the Hanford site got into this program because DOE 
at that time said we should look at sites that are already contaminated for repository sites. I want to point out a couple of things that come out of international repository related documents. The first one, this is from 1985, and it's a document called The Environmental and Ethical Basis of uh, long -lived radioactive, Disposal of Long-Lived Radioactive Wastes. It's from the um, Organization of Economic Development and the Nuclear Energy Agency. We've talked about that before. Th uh, this is worth reading. From an ethical standpoint, including long-term safety considerations, our responsibilities to future generations are better discharged by a strategy of final disposal than by reliance on stores which require surveillance, bequeath long-term responsibilities of care, and may in due course be neglected by future societies whose structural stability should not be presumed. That's still valid today. Uh, we're looking at potentially a storage in this country, but I want everybody to understand there's an international consensus that the right path forward is, in fact, geologic disposal. And in fact, I wanted to show you some more recent documents. Uh, this one's called Moving Forward with Geological Disposal of High Activity Radioactive Wastes. And um, they note that geologic disposal system provides a unique level of duration and duration of protection for high activity, long lived radioactive wastes. The concept takes advantage of the capabilities of both the local geology and the engineering materials to fulfill specific safety functions. That's very important. You'll often hear critics of the program argue that repositories should rely solely on the natural barriers, and that is not an international consensus position, and it has never been part of the U.S. regulatory structure. Overwhelming scientific consensus worldwide is that geological disposal is, is feasible. Supported by experimental data, I'll try to show you pictures later on of some of the underground tests, um, looking in different geological formations, looking at different engineered materials. We've, looked, we've done surface investigations. We've done underground research facilities. We've done demonstrations of equipment and facilities. The current state of the art in modeling techniques is considered to be adequate for this program. The experience gained in operating underground repositories for other classes of wastes has been considered, and there have been advances in the best practice for performing safety assessments for potential uh, disposal systems. Dr. Garrick's going to be talking this afternoon about the types of risk analyses that can be done to look at these types of problems. Disposal can be accommodated in a broad range of geological settings. It's very important as long as these settings are carefully selected and matched with appropriate facility design and configuration and engineered barriers. Uh, just a few minutes, and this is from a, a collective statement by the NAEA RAMAC group. Uh, just a little bit, a few minutes ago, uh, John was talking about engineer barrier concept, multi-barrier concepts. This is what a repository is in a nutshell. It's a system of barriers that are designed to work together and that, we'll talk about that. I want to make sure we don't forget that, that uh, Jeff brought it up and John talked about it as well. Much of what has been done in this country has been done thinking about Yucca Mountain as a repository. And so we have to broaden our thinking if we're going to look at different rock types because we may have done some things that are not directly transferable to other rock types. But in general, you're looking at a system that starts with a solid waste form, a uh, metal container, a metal overpack, buffers and backfills, and the geological environment. That's the multi-barrier system, and all those things have to be considered together. I wanted to give you a, a look at, a, at the magnitude of the problem and maybe make an observation or two about um, the regulations. Let me just see if I can make the laser button work. It doesn't work very well. There, there are a couple of numbers here that I want to look at. I want to look at 10,000 years, uh, 100,000 years, and a million years. Um, the older regulations in the U.S. required uh, isolation for 10,000 years. Uh, this happens to be a relative activity chart. If we had done a relative hazard chart, done the way they did it in the, in the late 70s and early 80s by looking at the amount of water you would have to dilute these wastes in to meet the groundwater protection standards, you would find that the relative hazard of the nuclear waste met the relative hazard of the unmined ore, which is one on this relative activity, at about 10,000 years. And so that's a, a rational reason for having a 10,000-year standard. Um, there's no reason for a million-year standard. If you're going to pick one for decay, you should have probably picked 100,000 years, but that, well, we can talk about where the million years came from. This is, this is and, and you saw uh, earlier versions of this as well. It just shows that the fission products tend to decay a little bit more quickly than the actinides. I want to talk about the U.S.'s commitment to repository disposal. Um, 
in 19, we talked about the 1957 National Academy recommendation, and that dealt with waste from reprocessing, and they suggested we ought to be looking at a salt media for dealing with those wastes. There was a, an a second affirmation that was done in 1980 in what's called the Waste Confidence Rulemaking. That rulemaking came about as a result of a lawsuit. You'll often hear it referred to as filed by the NRDC. Um, the first NRDC lawsuit was not accepted by the government. The lawsuit that was filed by Northern States Power, which is now called Excel, joined by the NRDC, was um, uh, heard by the government. And that lawsuit was simply um, how can the federal government continue to license the operations of nuclear plants if they are not taking the waste for disposal? Remember, we're still thinking about reprocessing at this time to get the plutonium. And the 1980 Waste Confidence Rulemaking, which has been revisited since then, affirmed that there would be a repository to dispose of these wastes. Same time, the same year that the uh, waste confidence decision was, rulemaking was made, the uh, DOE issued an environmental, an environmental impact statement on the management of commercially generated nuclear waste. And they looked at uh, shooting it into the moon. They looked at transmutation, subsea bed disposal, burial and, uh, burial and ice caps. The record of decision from that EIS says the least risk to mankind comes from repository disposal. That's, again, an affirmation in this country that repository disposal is the right thing to do. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act, and, and believe me, I could spend several hours talking about that law, and wanted to make sure that you understood that that directed that there would be two repositories built in the United States. And the, the, the compromise position, this law took uh, easily three years to work through the different houses and committees that, that it worked, worked its way through. Um, the compromise that really led that law to be acceptable was that no one state would have to take all the wastes. That's a very important provision of that law. And you'll find <clears throat> that the, um, the, the 82 Act also allowed for the federal government to build a monitored retrieval storage facility. And there's one other position I thought about this morning that comes out of the Waste Policy Act that I should point out to you. It offered the federal government the opportunity to make a decision about what, whether it needed a separate repository for defense-related wastes. President Reagan signed a letter that said, no, we will commingle, we will put the defense wastes in the commercial repository, recognizing that that made the commercial waste subject to Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensing. Of all the things I'm going to talk about, all the laws and regulations, that's probably the one that can be changed if somebody wants to go back and issue that, because that's an administration position as relative to, as opposed to a law. The, um, where are we next? 1987 Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments, Policy Amendments Act. Uh, the single most important thing to that, which is known out here as a screw Nevada bill, is it broke that commitment that no one state would have to take all the waste. And if you want to find the number one reason why Nevada politicians are, are so resistant to a repository in the state, that's what it is, okay? The only reason the Waste Policy Act passed was because there was a commitment that no one state would have to take the waste. When they amended the Waste Policy Act in 87, they broke that and said one state's going to take all the waste. I've got the WIP Land Withdrawal Act on here for a specific reason. Um, it allowed, it was, it was the mechanism that allowed the uh, EPA regulation to be reinstated and transuranic waste to be disposed. But if you read uh, Section 12 of the WIP Land Withdrawal Act, it prohibits the disposal of high-level waste and spent nuclear fuel at WIP. So if you want to start talking about defense waste at WIP, that's a law change that has to happen. I wanted to bring up, um, I think I've got one more, but it's on the next page. On this page, I wanted to bring up uh, HJR uh, 87 in 2002. That's the Yucca Mountain Development Resolution, and that says, in the middle of that, there hereby is, a pr is approved the site of Yucca Mountain, Nevada, for a repository. That statement gener was generated following the legally allowed Notice of disapproval by the state of Nevada to the secretary's recommendation to go forward. And so the one thing that, that is worth knowing about that particular piece of legislation is Nevada had a chance to veto its, it, the secretary's recommendation for this to be the site. Congress overrode that. It's not really a veto. It's a notice of disapproval. And that law is on the books. Okay. Um, continuing along here, the... Um, sets of laws and regulations that I, that I want to talk about today. Are, are, I've kind of got them all on this page. Um, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, as amended, set forth 
with it, within all its pieces a path forward for high-level waste spent nuclear fuel and defense-related waste to be disposed of at Yucca Mountain. Um, the WIP Land Withdrawal Act, as I said, took care of the transuranic wastes. The WIP Land Withdrawal Act also reinstated 40 CFR 191, the Environmental Protection Agency regulation for compliance, which had been vacated in 1987 by a different lawsuit. Uh, that's why I put that up there. You've got uh, the, so 191 is now again usable. The Energy Policy Act of 1992 um, set EPA in a direction to create a Yucca Mountain specific standard, and that's where that came from. Um, the three sets of regulations that we deal with in the repositories in the United States, and there is no level, there's no comparable level of regulatory structure internationally. This is the most complex one. The other ones have bits and pieces that you could sort of tie to these, but this is the most complex structure. 40 CFR 191 is still, uh, still a valid law. It's what WIP is regulated under. The, which is what the ra radioactive components of RIP are, WIP are regulated under, and it is applicable to any repository other than Yucca Mountain. 40 CFR 197 is specifically applicable to Yucca Mountain. Site screening was done under 10 CFR Part 960. It's a Department of Energy regulation. When 10 CFR 960 was amended in uh, 1999, I think it was, to um, be specific to Yucca Mountain, Part 960 was also amended, and although it no longer allows the secretary to do site selection, it allows the secretary to do site screening for another program. Repository development, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission laws, 10 CF Part Part 60 is the general regulation. It is valid for any repository other than Yucca Mountain. Part 63 is a Yucca Mountain specific regulation. What I need to point out to you is although it looks like we have valid regulations for compliance, for screening, and for developing a repository, over the 191 um, and 60 were done before, literally before the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed in 82. 960 is, was very shortly after that. Those are 20-year-old regulations. And what you will find embodied, let me start with, with, with um, 63 particularly, is a more sophisticated approach to regulating a repository that takes advantage of the advancements that have made in total system performance assessment. The EPA regulation for 197 moved away from uh, what was called a CCDF, a cumul complementary cumulative distribution function, and actually looked at looking at disposal, looking at doses to the people who would be most affected by the repository. And part 963 was made so that it matched those two. What my, the point I'm trying to make simply is that I don't believe if we go forward with the repository program in this country, we will be able to use 191 960 and Part 60. They, they are just too outdated with respect to what we learned and how we advanced when we were looking at Yucca Mountain. So we probably would have to have a new regulatory structure as well. Jeff, I made it 14 minutes before you asked a question. I, just, I, I didn't catch what you said about 960. Would that need to be revisited? 960 is what, what, they, what we did when we, when we amended 960, what, excuse me, when Part 63 was developed, they went back and amended 960, and it is still valid as a rule. It will let you do screening up through the characterization phase. It will not let you make a site recommendation. That part. It's a good regulation for screening, I guess. The problem with it is all of the criteria in 960 are tied to 191 criteria, which are tied to Part 60 criteria, so they're dated. That, okay? That's, that's probably why it wouldn't work. Is that a question? No? The, yeah? The, okay, so updated needs are, are for 191, 960, 963, that those were the three you quoted. The, the ones on your left are the original regulations. The ones on your right are the ones that are Yucca Mountain specific. 197, 963, and 63 are Yucca Mountain specific. And those three would need to be updated? No, those are the three that can't be used for anything else. Okay, the three on this side can be used for others, but I think the technology and the regulatory structure is so outdated that it would be very difficult to use them. I would expect if somebody started to do screening under, um, well, for example, 197 has a million year compliance period. I think if we go into another, into another, regu into another repository screening program, nobody's going to let you go 10,000 years without putting a fuss up there. So it's, it's gonna, it, just, it just doesn't work well to believe that the existing regulatory structure, although legally it says it can be used for a new repository, is going to work. Okay. What I wanted to do was take a look 
at screening criteria, and I elected to use a set that came from the National Academy in 1978. Um, the reason I did this is these are not tied to a performance regulation. These are a little bit more general, and they are, in fact, the basis for the 960 uh, screening criteria. They are embodied and the basis for what used to be in Part 60, which are favorable and potentially adverse conditions that don't exist in 963 excuse me, in part 63. So um, I'm just going to go through about four or five of these slides to talk a little bit about what kinds of things you would look at if you were doing screening for a repository. There are geometrical and dimensional criteria. The repository needs to be at a sufficient depth. There needs to be adequate room to develop this facility. And you need information about the geometry, the physical chemical properties, and so forth in advance of the development of the site. Um, raises an interesting question because you would expect that you would be doing your site screening before you started doing specific characterization studies, which really means that you're going to have to take advantage of information that exists out there in the literature and hope that there's enough information to, um, to do the screening. Uh, I can give you an example here of how this worked in the past. Both the Hanford site and the Yucca Mountain site had had ongoing characterization activities at the time we were doing screening. You would find, you would find plenty of site-specific publications about those. The SALT repository program, which had seven sites in the first, in the first program, actually had to make do, there were very, was there one hole in Utah? I don't, yes, there was a hole in Utah, but generally they were relying on geologic survey type information. Um, there are Long-term stability criteria, and this, this is the one where you're going to look at that and say, how did Yucca Mountain get past that? So if anybody wants to ask that question, I will answer that question. But you're looking for a structurally stable geological block, should not be near a tectonic boundary, avoid faults along which rupture could occur, uh, avoid areas with abnormally high geothermal gradients or with evidence of relatively recent volcanic activity, and the mechanical property should assure stability during operation. I, it's the last one that Yucca Mountain meets. The rest of them you could say questionable. I, I, what I want to do is point out, and I don't mean to make light of this, when, when we were looking at Yucca Mountain in the late 1970s, the country had gone in, under the IRTA program, the National Waste Terminal Storage Program, had gone, had started looking at shale and granite sites, and in the mid-70s, the U.S. Geological Survey had published several papers that had to do with disposal in what's called the unsaturated zone, in having a repository above the water table. Yucca Mountain was and, and, and still is the only repository that, that's been looked at that's above the water table. And um, the project manager at that time, Don Veith, recognized these, these are the criteria that you should be looking at for a site, but there was very strong emphasis from the U.S. Geological Survey that if you could find one of these unsaturated zone sites, it had a lot of advantages. And in 1978, Don Veith wrote a letter to the National Academy of Sciences, and the letter basically says, look, we'd like to, we, would, we, we understand that, that we're not looking at um, unsaturated zones and, tech, and uh, volcanic rocks like tough in, in, the, in the National Screening Program, but it listed a, a half a dozen advantages that the Yucca Mountain site would have. And we, we listed the, the disadvantages as well. It's relatively youngest, one of the geologically youngest parts of the country. There is evidence of relatively geologically recent volcanism out there. There are earthquake questions about Yucca Mountain. Um, and, and all those were identified in the letter to the National Academy. And the National Academy letter came back and it, it essentially said it looks like it's worth studying. And of course, it has this last paragraph at the end that said, but watch out for volcanism and earthquakes and things like that. So, you know, people who think we got as far along with Yucca Mountain as we did and did not recognize there were some challenges to Yucca Mountain don't understand the history of what we were dealing with. We, we got into it deliberately. We knew we had to think about earthquakes. We knew we had to think about volcanism. But Yucca, the first one, does it make that it's not a stable geological block? Depends on how you want to define that. Yeah, I, I would tell you Yucca Mountain is a stable geological yeah. block, okay? Yeah. There, there is no significant faulting within the geologic block, okay? But somebody could argue that the Solitario Canyon fault, which is, you know, I should have told you that picture. Since I didn't want to show a picture of Yucca Mountain, I showed you a picture of Solitario Canyon, and that was Jet Ridge, and that was Yucca Mountain. So, you know, that, that's a fault, but it's a block-bounding fault, and it's, in fact, not the one that would dictate the earthquake that we have to consider for the, for the repository design. Um, okay. Geochemical criteria, these are pretty obvious. Want to be able, excuse me, I, I think that went too 
Hydro, yeah, there we go, hydrological criteria. Um, you're looking for fluid transport that will not move the hazardous material to the biosphere in amounts and rates above prescribed limits. This is the single biggest advantage of Yucca Mountain. We're, we're in a desert, and there's very little water that has the potential to contact that waste and move it out to people. Um, systems should be capable of being sealed when the repository is closed. Uh, if you go back and look at the reasons for the sealing regulations in 10 CFR 60, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, rule, they're different from why you would be sealing at Yucca Mountain. In fact, you probably didn't need seals at Yucca Mountain other than the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission rule said you needed them. Um, need to be able to do long-term hydrologic predictions. The geochemical criteria, you're worried about physical and chemical reactions in the, in the rock that would compromise containment. I want to tie this back to John's talk just a little bit ago. I mean, when we were talking about the, the engineered components and the natural components and the fact that, the, the, for example, the waste glasses that have been done today were done thinking about the environments that would exist in a site like Yucca Mountain, if you went to a different repository site, you could have very different geological uh, geological environments or geochemical environments, and it could very much impact what you would, what we have already done to date in the glass waste forms, uh, particularly dissolution of the waste form. Water should not uh, react to increased permeability, and uh, you ought to limit the mobility of the radionuclides. That's another thing that Yucca Mountain was pretty good for, except for a couple of them. Um, geoeconomic criteria, this is the classic, you ought not to um, try to build a repository in an area where there's a potential for resources correction. That's, that's pretty obvious. Okay. The, um, that's mining, yeah, that's mining. In fact, if, well, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, in fact, I'll get to it on the next slide. The, um, these are, and I, I should have made them a little bit more generic, uh, reasonably maximally exposed individual is a Yucca Mountain specific term. I should have said somebody. You want to, what you're really trying to do with a repository is limit radiological exposures to somebody, limit releases of radionuclides to protect the groundwater, and limit the radiological exposures in the event of human intrusion. And the human intrusion one is the one that's most closely related to that mining one. Uh, somebody could drill a borehole through a repository, inadvertently contact a waste package, and say, for example, take waste material and bypass all the repository seals and protections and put it right in the, way, in the, in the groundwater system and bypass the whole thing. And you do have to look at that um, for a repository. Within the U.S. regulations, um, you, if you happen to be looking, looking at a repository in sedimentary rocks like WIP, a salt repository, you have to assume more potential penetrations of the repository than you do if you're not in sedimentary rocks. And the reason is the sedimentary rocks are more likely to have oil and gas for oil and gas exploration. Um, the, within the U.S. regulations, and, and I think this is pretty consistent internationally, um, Compliance, a demonstration of compliance requires what's called a performance assessment. And what you're trying to do is quantitatively estimate radiological risk exposure. What we had at Yucca Mountain in Part uh, 63 was known as a risk informed probability based regulation. It's a relatively um, more sophisticated approach to regulations than old Part 60 was, the original regulation. The original regulation, which I said was, uh, I think the technical, technical criteria came out in the very late 70s or early 80s at the latest. There was enough concern about predicting for 10,000 years in the future, based on our experience with computer modeling at that time, that the regulation embodies what are known as subsystem performance criteria. You had to look at a groundwater travel time. You had to look at a dissolution rate. You had to look at a waste package lifetime. Under the, the risk-informed probability-based approach that's more current in the regulations, you are actually able to make decisions and projections based on what things are most important to performance that you can deduce from your modeling. So you no longer have those subsystem performance objectives so specifically called out in the regulation. That, that okay? That I kind of... that. That's, that's a two-hour lecture in itself, yeah. Mike, uh, on the one million year requirement versus the 10 million or 10,000 year right. uh, piece of the legislation, can you help me understand what's driving the one million other than an understanding of where peak dose? Well, no, that's exactly what it was. The national, that, that 1992, um, Energy Policy Act that I told you um, directed the Environmental Protection Agency to promulgate a Yucca Mountain specific regulation required them to contract with the National Academy of Science to answer three questions. And the three questions had to do 
more essentially because Part 191 was not a, a dose-based regulation; it was a release-based regulation. The the um, National Academy, which understood this problem quite well, said. We want to look at the people who are most affected by this repository, and to do that, you need a dose-based repository. We don't care what the population dose to the world is from a repository. We want to know what the dose is to the people who live in Amargosa Valley. The other two questions had to do with whether um, institutional controls could be relied on um, to prevent uh, human intrusion. Um, the National Academy answered those three questions, but they answered some other questions as well, and that's where the problem came. One of the questions they answered was that given the um, robustness of the waste package and uh, waste forms that we're looking at for a, for a repository at Yucca Mountain, it's very clear that peak dose was going to occur far after, after 10,000 years. And, and they, wanted to, they wanted to look at peak dose. Um, the best example is what if you've got a 10,000-year calculation and 20,000 years something happens and the, peak, and the dose is 10 times higher? Wouldn't you like to know that? Well, you know, we could have done that. We could have done a 20,000-year calculation. Well, the Academy, the, the Academy report said, we think that the period of geological Geologic stability at Yucca Mountain is about a thousand years, and we think that given a few structural assumptions, you ought to be able to do numerical modeling of that system over that period of time. That's what the National Academy said. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what I said. They said a million years. I, a million years. I'm only off by three orders of magnitude. They said a million years. I, 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 I'm sitting here chuckling. I, I shouldn't have made that mistake. The person who wrote that sentence in that EPA report was my thesis advisor, and I give him crap about that every time I see him. Um, they did not, th th that, that statement in the, in the National Academy report has another sentence uh, literally next to it in the report that said, but we understand that there could be other reasons, you know, just because we'd like to see. Um, peak dose calculation doesn't mean there wouldn't be policy reasons. And you can interpret this one of two ways. And it basically said the policy reason sets consistency with other regulations. I would say, well, if you do uh, 10,000 years for RECRA, which is the only other one that ever Resource Conservation Recovery Act has a provision that allows um, um, no migration variance petitions. And if you were to uh, look at what EPA has done historically for that, they sort of accept 10,000 years as if you can show it's going to stay there for 10,000 years, that's, it's not going to migrate. Well, you can read that to say the policy was that the U.S. has always looked at 10,000 years, so this one should be 10,000 years. You can also read that sentence to say if it should be a million years at Yucca Mountain, you ought to go back and adapt RECRA to a million years. So it's, a, it's, it's, con, it's, it's difficult. Um, there was a lawsuit about that when, when we went through the lawsuits for the uh, site recommendation. There were a tremendous number of lawsuits and they were all consolidated into a complex case. And um, I think there were probably roughly nine different pieces of that lawsuit that had to do with, or, with whether or not the President had the authority to recommend the site, whether the Secretary of Energy followed the rules, just right on down the line, all these different things. The only one that the uh, D.C. District Court of Appeals bought was the million-year argument, and the, the 10, 40 CFR 197 was originally remanded because it was not the 10,000-year standard that was originally in 197 was not based upon and consistent with the, with the NAS recommendations of the EPA, which the they believed was required by law. Um, almost all of us involved in that believed that EPA could have fought that and won that remand just by putting a better argument together for the policy arguments. They elected not to do it, and we ended up with a million-year standard at Yucca Mountain. And incidentally, the Yucca Mountain site looked as if it would have met a million-year standard. Okay, um, moving right along. I wanted to make a, an observation about what performance assessment is. It's a systematic analysis that looks at the features, events, and processes that might affect performance of the geologic repository. It examines their effects on performance and estimates the radiological exposures. That's a pretty simple explanation of something that's that much of our license application. But really, what, what, given the, the risk um, the risk-informed performance-based nature of the regulation. This is an opportunity to allow you to look at the different things that could happen to a repository over 10,000 years, and I'll explain that in just a minute, and um, say, I can show you that this particular thing that could happen does not have an impact on repository performance, therefore I don't have to include it in my calculations. 
And the reason I said 10,000 years is because the way the regulation is written based on the National Academy of Sciences recommendation, we really look at only three or four things that happen after a million years. Everything else we look at is based upon what happens within the first 10,000 years. So we don't have to look at I don't, a geochemical change. We don't have to predict a geochemical change that could occur a million years in the future. We look at geochemical changes over 10,000 years and assume that's what's going to happen over the million year period. That's what the regulation allows us to do. We do, however, have to look at million year volcanism, million year climate, million year um, seismicity, and um, there are two others. One of them has to do with corrosion, and um, NRC was the person, that was the group that urged the EPA to put corrosion in this million year thing, and that's simply because we, we didn't want, they did not want corrosion to be screened out, which is the process I'm talking about. If it doesn't have an impact, you don't have to consider it. If we don't have corrosion failure within the first 10,000 years, we wouldn't have to consider corrosion after 10,000 years, the way the regulation was written. So NRC said, no, we want corrosion to be one of the things you have to look at. And the other one had to do with groundwater table rise, and that's another hour lecture, and we, we won't go into that one. Um, one of the ways you address uncertainties in a performance assessment is through the use of multiple barriers. And you're, you're, you're looking in our regulation, we were required to have an engineer barrier system in addition to the natural barriers provided by the geologic system. They had to work together. You had to have both of them. And I thought, I think, um, oh, you can tell if I have a white figure like this. It's one of Dr. Hornberger's slides that I didn't change. So that's, um, and this is just a kind of a, a, a quick listing of some of the features, events, and processes that you would have to look at in a performance assessment uh, calculation. What, what could possibly happen over time? Um, I wanted to keep a piece of uh, Dr. Hornberger's presentation. He, he had a, quite a bit about WIP in his. And uh, the waste isolation pilot plant was designed as a repository for defense-related transuranic wastes. And it was the first mined deep geological repository in the world to receive waste, and it received that waste in 1999. Uh, it's embedded salt almost 2,000 feet below the ground surface. It's down near Carlsbad, New Mexico. It's operational. Um, I, will, I will read one of Dr. Hornberger's slides. Um, advantages of salt, um, he believes, are found in stable geological areas with little earthquake activity. The absence of flowing fresh water, and the argument is if water were present, the salt would have dissolved. Relatively easy to mine. Salt heals its own fractures because of its plastic nature. It moves back in to fill um, the mined areas and seal the radioactive waste from the environment. Uh, WIP works very well. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And, and I might as well just put this on the table right here. Um, I think you'd, you'd, you'd have a very easy time getting the technical community to agree that high-level waste is probably reasonable to put in waste. I think you'd have a little bit more difficulty getting everybody to agree that spent nuclear fuel could go in salt. I think there's just a few too many questions that have to be answered. doesn't mean it can't. It just means that it, there's a temperature issue, and I'm going to talk, hopefully I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the temperature issues as well a little bit later on. Uh, here's a picture of the, uh, one of the test cavity, cavities in the salt, uh, re salt repository program at WIP. And that led, me, led Dr. Hornberger to talking about under, underground research laboratories. And here's two or three of them. This is the, uh, uh, the uh, boom clay in Belgium. Could have been almost a shale. Um, there, are granite, there are granitic rocks. Notably absent from his slide was the uh, exploratory studies facility at Yucca Mountain. So I thought I'd show, since I can't take you in there anymore, I thought those of you who have never seen the north ramp of the uh, ESF at uh, Yucca Mountain might enjoy it. It's a very pretty tunnel. That's uh, the first mile of getting to the underground facility at Yucca Mountain. You get around the corner at the bottom. This is a look down the, uh, the main north-south north, north -south, uh, access, or north-south north uh, drift of the, uh, the repository. To, the, to your right would have been where the development of the repository took place. It would have been off in that direction. To your left, is an experiment, a relatively large experiment. I'll show you a, a picture of it in a minute, but I wanted to show for you, I'll try this laser thing again, these things up here. Um, those are collection 
devices for a very, very large scale hydrologic experiment that was run in a cross tunnel above this main tunnel where we literally had water ponded on the floor of that tunnel to see how it would make its way down fractures and we captured it in this, in this apparatus down here. The next slide I wanted to show you is the, uh, the, the full scale demonstration of what a repository drift would look like. Those are electrical resistance heaters as opposed to using live waste. But this was designed to be an eight year long experiment where we did four years of heat up and four years of cool down. In, uh, uh, at, at, at its hottest, you could have cooked, it, cooked your Thanksgiving turkey in that, uh, in that little room. But we did look at what we were trying to do with this experiment was really mobilize water. Remember, we're in the unsaturated zone, and there is actually free water in the unsaturated zone. It's just not standing like you would find it at a water table. It's, it's, it's in poor spaces. And the, one of the biggest questions about Yucca Mountain would be when you started putting all this heat into a repository at Yucca Mountain, it would cause that the water in the pores to turn to steam, and it would move away. And the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board actually had questions about would that, would, would that steam move above the repository, condense back to water over time, and come back and drip down in the, in the, in the repository proper. So that, and that experiment really, I think it's probably an uh, important point to emphasize. Um, much of what you do in characterization of a site for looking at a repository, you might do from boreholes from the surface, for example. You could figure out what the rock types were, the rock, where, where the rock types changed, where the water was in the system. You could do big water pressure tests and see how the water moved. What you can't do in borehole tests is test system processes, and that's what we're doing here. We're looking at system response to a very, this is full scale, to a, a huge stimulus. And we're talking about probably tens of millions of cubic feet of rock being affected by this test. And we use that to calibrate the numerical models to be able to predict how Yucca Mountain would perform. That, that process level testing is almost impossible to do unless you have an underground facility where you can get into it and do those experiments. Okay, um, what's going on in the world today? Um, Sweden has submitted its license application. Finland has got a site selected. Great Britain had lost its site, and it's back around now doing a generic safety case. And the site where they originally wanted to do the development, which they were not allowed to do development at Sellafield, is now saying maybe you should come look at a Sellafield for a repository. It's kind of interesting. But they're doing a generic safety case. The Yucca Mountain history for the last couple of years, we submitted our license application on June 3rd. Um, September 8th, 2008, the Nuclear Regulatory Com Commission docketed our license application. March 3rd, 2010, the Department of Energy moved to withdraw the license application. The original statements by the Secretary of Energy would have suggested that there was something technically wrong with the site. They very quickly moved away from that. And the argument you've heard since that date essentially is that it's lack of local acceptance for the repository, which is the reason they want to uh, withdraw the Yucca Mountain license application. <clears throat> That's debatable, incidentally. Um, there, there are letters from six, six counties in the area of Yucca Mountain that all support Yucca Mountain. The problem is the state is adamantly against it. And it goes all the way back to that breaking that commitment in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act that only one state would not have, would not have to take all the waste. Would, would, they, would they be okay if there were two states and they didn't have to take it all? No, but that... that <laughs> 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 no, it's it's become it's Somebody become it, it's too mu it's too ingrained. Yeah. In, in, it's too ingrained yeah. in the state. Um, yeah. um, the only argument I can give you, and well, I want to I want to do the Blue Ribbon Commission separately. Okay, give, give, hang with me for a minute. Um, uh, very shortly after the motion to withdraw, the the um, um, Atomic Safety and Licensing Board denied that withdrawal, and we're still waiting for the commission to act on that. There were lawsuits filed by states that. Uh, Washington State and South Carolina that have an interest in some defense waste. Uh, that lawsuit was heard, and um, we had a, a, an opinion on July 1st. It was not the opinion that people expected or wa wanted, but it did say that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has to act. And the, the beauty of that court case, uh, that position, was uh, the judges were kind enough to say, you know what you really should have done was this. And um, given the time frame for that, that hearing, that if if the, if the plaintiffs would like to have the same judges, they're probably going to refile very quickly. Huh? That's about all I can say on that. I, I suspect that you're, you're about to see, lawsuits, see, see the lawsuits reinstated. Okay, what's going to happen in the future? I think I've probably said a few of these things. 
Um, the, the, the U.S. repository system as it exists today was built around Yucca Mountain. And probably the single biggest thing that I should have put on this view graph is that Yucca Mountain is a system of oxidizing conditions. And almost every other repository we would be looking at, we would be looking for reducing conditions. And so many of the things that we did at Yucca Mountain, the waste package materials, the geological environments, geochemical environments, are oxidizing. And that's the, thing, the single thing that's the most concerned about moving to a different repository type with the technology that's been developed to date. I think John did a very good way of showing you there are a lot of other options. It's not that it can't be done, it's just that the history that we're talking about was so Yucca Mountain dominated. The, the waste acceptance criteria really evolved with the Yucca Mountain designs. I wanted to, to point out that the storage concepts that exist at, see this is what, where I would not have a, a independent used fuel Storage installation, what, any, an ISFC, an independent spent fuel storage installation, uh, those are huge containers. And they were actually talking about being able to move containers of that size, size to Yucca Mountain, especially with the, the TADS design that was, was for Yucca Mountain. Those were compatible with disposal at Yucca Mountain because Yucca Mountain had ramp access. You can't put things that big down shafts, and so you have to rethink access to repositories. The open nature of the Yucca Mountain repository um, really had storage going on for quite a long period of time, potentially in that repository before you did the closure. That's the aging part about it that's going to, that's going to come back and hit you because in a couple slides from now that I want to talk about, simply that we were able to put big hot waste packages into, into Yucca Mountain because you could do some aging and ventilation in that repository system. Retrievability is very desirable so that we don't limit future options. Um, an open repository like Yucca Mountain had that. It might be very difficult to do retrievability of spent nuclear fuel in a salt repository. That, that's probably the, the di most difficult challenge. We also have to remember that we do have state prohibitions on nuclear development. Um, I think there were 17 states originally. I think Illinois and Kentucky were relaxing theirs. But nonetheless, that, that until we have a repository, there are a number of states in this country that will not allow future nuclear development, reactor development in those states until that problem is solved. I wanted to give you, at least for your records, a little bit of uh, information about the different geologic media that we could, pens could potentially be looking at. This has got salt, clay shale, and uh, uh, granitic rocks, uh, crystalline rocks. And borehole is really not a media, but we've got it on this chart because we're looking at borehole type repositories. They're very closely related to, they probably would be in crystalline rock. And what you can see from that is some of the media have favorable conditions with respect to certain things unfavorable conditions, con conditions with respect to other things. There's nothing on that chart that I can see that would prevent us from doing a repository development in any one of those, any one of those site types of rocks if we just did it very carefully, with the exception of one thing. It's, it's, it's not an exception. It's just be aware of this kind of thing. And it has to do with the waste package sizes. And I'll do that one, react, one, one slide after this one. I wanted to point out, and, and this, is, this is a bit dated, um, but it gives you an idea for your, uh, for your records of the amounts of material we're dealing with. Um, this is from uh, the repository supplemental environmental impact statement that, that, was the, that accompanied the license application. If you look at that, you can see that the proposed action was 63,000 metric tons of waste, um, the 2,300 tons of DOE spent fuel, and uh, it's 9,300 canisters of DOE high-level waste. That was the proposed action. When you looked at two different modules, one of them dealt with all the waste, all the commercial spent nuclear fuel, and all the GTC C wastes, then each of those modules had a, had a different case. One of them was an inventory without recycling, one of them was an inventory with recycling, and it was one of the GNEP alternatives that we looked at to get these numbers. But you can see what we're talking about, 36,000 canisters of DOE high-level waste, all the way up to 176,000 cubic meters of greater than class C waste. We're looking at tremendous amounts of materials that have to be dealt with. I'll let you read that as long as you want. I gave it to you more for your record so that you can see um, what we're dealing with here and under different scenarios. And you can see that um, number of high-level waste canisters goes up significantly when you, if, you start, if you reprocess it all. Well, actually, this will, not, this will not reprocess it all. This will assume that the 63,000 metric tons that literally exist today is legacy waste and would not go back and reprocess that. doesn't mean you couldn't, just that that's the assumption that's in this chart.
And I think you can probably scale almost any possible combination you want to think at from these. Yeah. Uh, plus the Navy fuel. The Navy fuel's in there. Uh, in, in, yeah, the Navy fuel's considered is in that. It's 60, uh, there's only a very small part of it. Uh, the DOE spent nuclear fuel <laughs> includes the Navy fuel, the 2,300 tons. Okay. okay. And that, that, that's, probably the, that's probably the piece of the system that's most difficult to figure out what we're going to do with because that is so Yucca Mountain specific, what, they, what they've done. And, and those, are, those are the biggest waste, con waste containers that we have to deal with. And Mike, you might want to point out the law originally just said we would only have 70,000 metric tons. The, tons. Yeah, well, actually, the law doesn't quite say that. It says you can't put 70,000 metric tons, can't put more than 70,000 in the first repository until the second repository is licensed. Okay, and so there really is not a, there, there is a 70,000 limit on Yucca Mountain because they killed the second repository program. But there was a provision in the law that said the secretary was to give Congress a report on the need for a second repository. That was done also. Um, incidentally, that report, I, I, my, my fingerprints are on that report to, with a few other people. Um, I, I wish it had said it a little bit differently because people can hold up that report and say, see, they want to put it all on Yucca Mountain. In actual fact, that report could have been written exactly the same information presented a little bit differently. And the, the real argument is you need a second repository, okay? If you want to, you could put it in, in Yucca Mountain. It, it really doesn't come across that way. Yucca Mountain will hold it. That's not an argument for putting it there. The, the real argument is you need a second repository. You have to make a decision in law about what you're going to do about that, whether you're going to actually re reinstitute the second repository program. I got all this way and never showed you a picture of what a waste package looked like, so I thought I'd throw one in. And um, you can't accuse me of marketing Yucca Mountain here because this is not the Yucca Mountain license application design. It doesn't have tabs in it. But this is just to give you an idea of what these big waste packages look like. You can see um, PWR and BWR waste packages, uh, 22 and 44 uh, assemblies sitting in those packages. Those are big. And the, the, the middle one is a... Uh, 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 multiple canister overpack with high-level waste glass and the uh, defense uh, can in the middle of that, defense spent nuclear fuel can in the middle of it. And then just, just for grins, that's the Swedish waste package design. It's copper, a little bit smaller. Once upon a time, Yucca Mountain had smaller waste packages too. Are those B's or T's in that one that's got how many of them are on the map? I think those are B's. B's. I think they're B's. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm just a bit of a slow behind. Um, I wanted, th this, is, this is what I wanted to get to. Um, the, the, because of the sealing requirements the, the, that we would have for uh, shale and, yeah, I'll, I'll get it, shale and granite repositories, there's a thermal limit on the waste package. It's not being driven like things like centerline temperatures anymore. It's destroying the, 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 the uh, buffer materials, the, the, the diffusive barriers around it. And then you start looking at the number of waste packages we had uh, designed and allocated for Yucca Mountain. Those are the different waste package designs, 21 PWRs, 12 PWRs long, um, uh, absorber plates, uh, so forth, DOE shorts, the naval shorts and longs. Those are, the, those are the approximate number of waste packages we would have been looking at putting in Yucca Mountain. And just messing with the PWR and BWR ones, trying to make them smaller containers, look at the, the, how the, the number of waste packages shoots up. And that's what we're, we're talking, this is this, this is the 63,000, this is, not, this is not 130,000 metric tons, just double that. And that's the number of waste packages we're looking at in our repository program if we have to go to a smaller waste package because of temperature <laughs> limits in the different repository materials. Had to show a picture of Wendell Wirt. That's, that was the background for Dr. Hornberger's slide. I, Wendell's a good friend of many of us. He's the, one of the salt gurus. And I think the other two things I put in here for you, um, this is one of um, Dr. Hornberger's slides for the 1957 re Academy Report. The people who did it were the gods of our field. They were all, they're geoscientists who are also famous. They all have awards named after them today. And then um, somebody asked a question about uh, the different uh, nuclides of interest at different point in time. So I stole this from uh, Neil Chapman and Charles McCombie. But you can see what you're looking at cesium, strontium, where you're looking at iodine, and then where you're looking at the actinides. That's kind of where they really become the, the, the bigger part of the hazard over time. And I think that was, oh no, I had one more. I put a, t a time chart in there so you could see when we're talking about 100,000 years or a million years, what that really represents in terms of humankind. <laughs> 
Oh, I promised you the Blue Ribbon Commission. Do I have two more minutes? Okay. The Blue Ribbon Commission has draft recommendations out, and I want to read two of them to you. The Disposal Subcommittee has a recommendation that says, the United States should proceed expeditiously to develop one or more permanent deep geologic repository facilities for the safe disposal of high-level nuclear waste. And that, that use includes spent nuclear fuel. And the Storage and Transportation Committee has a recommendation that says the United States should proceed expeditiously to establish one or more consolidated interim storage facilities as part of an integrated comprehensive plan for managing the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. An effective integrated plan must also provide for the siting and development of one or more permanent disposal facilities. And the only comment I want to make on that is that's where we were in 1982 when the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed. Okay, any questions? All right, thank you.